If you would like to create your own XRF waterfall graph without using the provided macros Excel file, uh, you can import the data as we have done on a previous video. And so make sure you watch that other video for how to import XRF data without using the macros Excel file. And then you'll be left with this formatting over here. So this formatting is fine for a traditional XRF graph. We need to manipulate this slightly to get it into a waterfall graph. So the first thing that we will do is we will insert a column to the left of the energy column. Do so by highlighting the column A header, right click it, and select insert. Now in cell A1, type in waterfall offset. In cell A2, type in 5%. That number can be changed at a later time. 5% is just simply what I'm going with for now, as long as it has a percent at the end of it. Now, in cell A3, type in offset factor. In cell A4, A5, A6, and so on, start by typing 0, 1, 2, and so on and so forth, until you have enough numbers for the total number of samples that you have. This information along the left will allow us to offset our data from itself, or offset each sample's data from each other sample on our graph, and that will give us the waterfall aspect of our waterfall graph. Now, we need to manipulate this to make sure that our data has been normalized. Now, normalizing the data allows it to range from 0 to 1 and allows these offset factors and waterfall offset value to work the best and, and easiest, easiest. Now, before we normalize the data, we want to make sure that we do not normalize the scatter peaks with the data. To make sure that we do not normalize within this or with the scatter peaks, highlight column header B, hold shift as you highlight the last column header of your samples, in this case mine is E, um, select insert, go over to the charts drop down menu, and select the uh, insert uh, scatter with smooth lines section there. Zoom in on this more because we are interested in where this scatter peak starts. As we do not want to normalize this, we want to normalize just this over here. So, to figure out where this scatter peak starts, I need to increase how many units I show. So I'll double click the X axis to open up the Format Axis Options menu, and I'll select the major units to be something a little more appropriate that shows me more detail. This is perfect. This shows me that the scatter peak starts at roughly 12,000 EV. So, I want to find the row in my Excel sheet that corresponds to an energy of roughly 12,000 EV. So to figure out that row, I can close this, I can delete this graph, and I can scroll down the energy column until I reach 12,000. It's going to be a little while, so I'll speed it up. There we go. So right over here, 12,000 EV corresponds to a column, or apologies, row header uh, 1,202. So we'll just make a quick note of that number somewhere off to the side. 1,202 is what we are concerned with. Now, in terms of manipulating the sample data so that we have a normalized data set and our raw data set, we need to insert a column in between sample 1 and sample 2. Do so by highlighting sample 2's column header and selecting insert. Now, we're going to label this sample 1 processed. And that will let us know that this data has been uh, normalized and offset. Now, in cell D2, in this case, we are going to add a little Excel code. And that all starts with an equal sign. And then I'm going to type in C2. There we go. And that will highlight this one right over here. And that lets me know I'm grabbing from sample 1. I will divide that by a max function. Now, this max function will take out uh, all of the data and, uh, and pick out the largest data in that data set. Now, um, I want to make sure that I normalize with inside my data set. So I've started off at uh, row or cell number C2. And I want to go up until cell number 1202 to make sure that I don't go outside and into my scatter peaks. So that's why we've recorded that number over there. There we go. 
So by dividing each of these cells by this max function, I normalize the data. Now you'll notice that cell C2 right up at the start over here has no money signs. But inside of the max function, there are money signs in front of the C and in front of the number following it. That ensures that I normalize in the same range the entire time as the money sign tells Excel, keep the thing that follows it constant. Do not change the value of it. And that is going to ensure that I normalize in the same range the entire time. Now, um, when I extend this code to the remainder of this column, this front portion over here, C2, will change to C3, C4, C5, and so on and so forth as it goes down. So now this is done with the normalizing. I now need to add in my offset amount. So I do this by adding to the normalizing uh, this section right here. There we go. Now I want to make sure that I keep it constant the entire time as these numbers I do not want to have changed either. Alrighty, so this is what it should look like in terms of color coding and everything once you're done. So to recap, this blue color code right here for cell C2 tells me where the data I am now normalizing is and that we can see is right here. This max function as highlighted in red from C2 to C1202 is this column of red right here and I'm picking up the largest value in there and dividing everything by it, which normalizes it. And then adding um, cell A2 multiplied to cell A4. In this case, it's 0, but in other cases, it'll be 5%, 10%, and so on, which will allow me to offset my data from itself. Now, before you click anywhere else, make sure you hit the Enter key to actually submit the data and, and make, it, uh, make it take effect. To extend this code to the remainder of this column, simply double click this green square at the bottom right of that cell, and that will extend that on. Now we're going to repeat this process for the remaining sample sets. So right click the column header, select insert, sample to process. Now we can copy and paste the code, uh, but when you do so, make sure you hit enter before you click anywhere else. Uh, paste the code into there. Now, this is all taking from sample 1's data, so I want to shift this over to be sample 2's data. Now you can just click and drag the squares over and it will uh, fix them for you, or you can physically go in here and change the, uh, the lettering. So all of the C's became E's, and this 4 at the end became a 5. We do not want to change the waterfall offset amount because that is going to be consistent throughout. So make sure to hit enter, finalize the code, extend that code to the remainder, and you can already see that sample 1 that has been processed as 0, sample 2 that's been processed is at 5% higher. And again, copy and paste the code, enter in there, we can paste that into there. I forgot to label this sample 3 processed. So this code will go back into here and we'll make sure to shift it over for the actual sample 3 data. And we'll shift that down and make sure to hit enter to finalize the code. Double click that green square to send it down to everything else. There you go. So all of these column headers with processed in their name are the waterfall ready data. Now it's a matter of graphing the waterfall graph. So if I highlight the column B header for the energy column, and if I hold control and select all of the column headers that have processed in their name, I will grab all of the data corresponding to the waterfall graph. Going up here to insert or Excel's insert tab, over to the middle section here for the insert scatter or bubble chart drop down menu, go over here with the scatter with smooth lines option and select that. And so we can see right here that the data has been scaled, normalized, and offset. Now it doesn't quite show it as well as the scatter peak primarily dominates everything. I'm not interested in the scatter peaks at all. I'm interested in this data down here. So if I double click the y axis numbers, I can, well, first and foremost, set my minimum bound to zero, as we will never detect a negative amount of photons. 
And I can set my maximum bound in this case to probably one, but uh, we'll, we'll go two for now. Or probably one and a half, but we'll go two for now. Yeah, perfect. So one and a half would do it. So I'll change that to 1.5. There we go. Now we can see that the three sample sets are actually offset from each other. It was just this dominating scatter peak that, uh, that changed it. Actually, I'm going to change this to 1.2 uh, to get rid of as much white space as possible. And now we can really see that they are offset from each other. Now, just with the traditional graphs, we're not interested in the scatter peak, and we're not interested in anything below what our detector can detect. So I'll double click the x axes uh, and change their minimum bounds to be 2,000, and the maximum bound to be 12,000. There we go. Now these units are far and few between, so if I go over here to the major units, I can change that and add more markers. And likewise with the y-axis, I can do the same there. And that just makes it easier to grab uh, the values from the data. Now, the last thing that this graph is missing are titles. First and foremost, a graph title. XRF Waterfall Example. You'll probably put your sample name there. Now, back up here to the top right to the green cross, this is our Charts Elements option. Choose the axis titles. Now, over here, under the photon count, which is the, what this typically is, because we have normalized our graph, this is now relative intensity. Relative intensity, perfect. Now, under here, under the bottom, this is our energy. So we'll change that to our energy EV. There we go. So now this graph is ready to pull information from. I have another video that will show you how to identify what elements are inside of here. So make sure you check that video out before you start pro or analyzing what's going on inside here. This video will specifically focus on um, interpreting a waterfall graph. So for a quick recap, the too long didn't read of the previous video, you match the elemental peaks, the energies, with a data booklet to verify what elements are inside there. The taller the peak, the more abundant the element is. Now, that is true for any given sample set. But if you're working between two different sample sets, the differences in heights can be from different factors. The thickness of the sample, how much of the sample you put in the sample holder, uh, how much air was in there, and, and various other parameters that affect these ratios. So what a waterfall graph is meant to do is allow you to compare the elemental trends within a sample to the elemental trends within different samples. So it's all about trend comparison, not actual value comparison. And that's also why we say it's relative intensity, as we're not interested in the exact hiding of everything, we're interested in the relative changes of everything. Alrighty. Now that we have this graph shown, I can change a few of these parameters off to the left to show you what uh, changing them does. So for instance, I'm going to change the waterfall offset amount. This time we'll make it larger to 10%, and we can see that these graphs have scaled themselves out further. Now if I lower this down to 0%, uh, they were over top of each other as a traditional XRF graph. But as this is a waterfall graph, a little more separated is the way to go. Alrighty, so that is an XRF waterfall graph. 